Welcome to High Cheese. It's Friday, July 26, 2024. So the Democrats finally swapped out Joe Biden for Kamala Harris. And this came as no surprise. And this is how they worked. The party elites, they wanted Joe gone. And it was a little difficult. Joe didn't want to go. I don't think he still wants to go. But the party elites wanted Joe gone. He couldn't beat Joe Biden, so we had to bring in somebody new to take on Donald Trump. But this is how they work. This is just indicative of how they want to run this country. It's not about democracy. It's about what we want. And this is how they view Americans. It doesn't matter what you want. It was what we want. We're the party bosses. We're the party elites. And we want Joe gone. And we're going to do everything we can to get rid of Joe Biden. And like I said, Joe didn't want to go. And remember, they did the same thing in the uh, 2020 primaries. Remember, Joe Biden was getting beat up. He was consistently polling in third, fourth place. Wasn't winning many primaries. But for some reason, the party bosses thought that Joe Biden was the man. And they all pressured the other candidates to drop out. We're gonna, we anointed Joe Biden and we're going to go with him. It's not about democracy. It's about what the elites want. And remember that because this is how they want to run America. It's not what you want. It's what we want. But let's take a look at Kamala. She's got a tough road to hoe. Not only does she have to inherit the policies of her administration, high inflation, wars throughout the world, bad economy, and a bad border. But she's more liberal than Joe Biden. She wants free health care for illegal migrants. She wants massive amnesty for illegal migrants. She wants to take away people's freedoms. Let's take a look at a couple of things that she did when she was uh, the the attorney general of California. She kept inmates in longer than they should have been because she needed them to do uh, essentially slave labor. What happens is a lot of inmates in California, a lot of other states too, they they do work. And she wanted them to do more work while they were incarcerated, she kept them in longer than they should have been in order to do this slave labor. She prosecuted African-American males for small, petty marijuana crimes. Yet she looked the other way for high-profile elites in California. So she's got to an answer for all this. And it's interesting. The strategy that these Democrats, the media, is to do a blitz. We're going to blitz Kamala out there. We're going to put her name out there. We're going to show her all this type of support because they don't want the truth to come out. Eventually, it will with Donald Trump. But this is the person they want to coalesce around, and it's a blitz. Everything you read in the paper, oh, Harris doing a great job having the party coalesce around her. That's not her. It's the party making the decision to coalesce around her. They talk about all this fundraising. And quite frankly, I don't don't believe the numbers. It had nothing to do with her. And then you've got social media and TikTok. These people out there say, oh, we love Kamala Harris. Why? Oh, we don't know, but we love her. So it's this blitz. It's this manipulation of the American public or the attempted manipulation of the American public to just blitz Kamala Harris. She's the best thing. And they're not going to give people time to rationalize this, to think about it. But that's what they're doing. Look at the cleanup that the media is trying to do with her. 
Everybody's talking about the border czar that Biden named her the border czar. Now, one thing about the border czar, the border czar is simply a vernacular term. It's not an official title. It's just an, a vernacular term that people use to give in, somebody in the White House administrative authority to oversee something. It's not an official position. But the media created that term. And now they're in denial because the border is a mess and linking Kamala Harris to the border doesn't help Kamala Harris. Because when the Republicans come out and rational people come out and say, well, wait a second. The border is a mess and Biden appointed her the borders are. Oh, no, no, he never appointed her the borders are. He never did that. And they got caught. I think there was an Axios reporter that came out literally and said, no, Biden never named her the border czar. And then people go back a couple years ago and pull out an article from Axios, which she was in saying that Biden appointed Kamala the border czar. And this is what the Bolsheviks do. They just wipe out history or they want to wipe out what the media said about Kamala Harris. Oh, ignore the past. Ignore what we said before. Because we have a new history now. And this is what they want to do to the United States. Just wipe out history. Wipe out what the media said about Kamala before. Just ignore that. It's the new Kamala. We have to ignore this. And with that said, I want to go to a clip. It's going to be, uh, it may be a little hard to listen to uh, because the video is much better. It's one of the downsides of not doing video. But um it's a compilation of the media years ago calling Kamala the border czar and what they're trying to do today. So let's go to this clip and then we'll come back and discuss. Quote unquote border czar. Vice President Harris was not a border czar. Meantime, Vice President and border czar Kamala Harris facing some backlash. What he said about Harris and immigration was not true. She was never appointed border czar. Uh, and this will be her first visit to the uh, U.S.-Mexico border region since she was appointed as the border czar by President Biden. People going to have to counter the misinformation. You already hear folks talking about the border czar. She wasn't the border czar. President Biden tapped Kamala Harris, Vice President Kamala Harris, to be the border czar. Now, she wasn't the border czar. That's what Republicans uh, labeled her. They were very critical of Kamala Harris, especially in her role as border czar. Now what she's up against is folks lying about her border record, calling her a border czar. Kamala Harris, who was appointed as the border czar. And the video actually does this more justice, but it's funny to see today where they're saying she was not the border czar. And then the video shows a clip years ago of the media calling her the border czar. Are they that dumb? Are they that dumb? Do they not know that we're going to find this out? Now there's a political website called uh, GovTracks. And years ago, they had ranked Kamala Harris as the most liberal senator in the Senate. Now when you go back and take a look at this uh, website, they wash the page. And what they're now saying, well, she's not the most liberal Senator. I think they ranked several other senators above her. And when they were confronted this uh, week with it, their answer was, well, we had changed the metrics on it. There's, you know, it's not fair to Kamala Harris that we uh, rank her the highest. And again, this is what the Bolsheviks do. This is what the communists do. Oh, you fall out of favor with us? We'll just change all the pictures that we have, all the photographs in our history. We'll take your face out of it. We'll change things. We'll mislead the people. And this is what they're doing here. And they're arrogance. They think they can get away with it, but they can't because the truth will always come out. And with that said, I want to go to another clip. It's with uh, Donald Trump at his North Carolina rally this past weekend. And uh, he's going to tell you the truth. And let's go to this clip where... Donald Trump talks about Kamala. 
Kamala Harris is the most liberal elected politician in American history. Did you know that? She's an ultra liberal politician. She's absolutely terrible. She's, as you know, more liberal than Bernie Sanders. Can you believe it? She's rated far more liberal than Bernie Sanders. And she's now trying to get rid of her record, but she can't. She's going out and saying things that she doesn't believe. And if she ever got in, she'd destroy this country so fast. So she was the border czar, but she never went to the border, right? She, she never, she was appointed by this horrible president, this horrible guy. As border czar Kamala threw open our borders and allowed 20 million illegal aliens to stampede into our country from all over the world. As vice president, she cast the tie-breaking votes that created the worst inflation in a half a century, decimating middle-class families and hurting very badly, as you know, all people in North Carolina. And the press has come out with these polls and they're trying to put the best frame on these polls. Harris is in striking distance. They're within, she's within the margin of error. Now, Harris is doing better than Biden in the polls. But if you took a look at the conglomerate of the polls, Trump is still winning. Well, it is closer right now. And all you hear from the press, she's within the margin of error. And one thing, they, why are they ignoring the Rasmussen poll that said uh, that Trump is beating Harris by seven points? Now, Rasmussen is a reliable poll. They usually poll likely voters, not registered voters. I don't know why they're ignoring that one. But they're doing everything to pump up Kamala. It's part of the blitz. And if she makes it through the convention, she'll get another bump. But I'm not convinced she's going to make it through the convention. Now, what they're trying to do, the Democrats, they're trying to lock up all the delegates before the convention actually starts. They're trying to get the delegates to vote electronically for Kamala Harris before the the convention starts because they don't want to fight. They don't want to fight on the convention floor. And let me take you to Joe Biden's speech. Now, why would anybody even want to listen to this guy? He's incapacitated. He's a lame duck. But his speech was just uh, not worthwhile. All it was was uh, a campaign speech, counting the Democrats. But one thing I did take away from this uh, speech that he made is I, he didn't want to go. Joe still didn't want to go. So the way I see it right now is Kamala has a month. It's her audition. Previously, I said that um, the debate with Trump was uh, Biden's audition, and he failed. So Kamala has about a month to audition for this position. And if she doesn't do well, if she doesn't lock up the delegates, they may swap her out. So one of the tactics I think that the Democrats are going to play, and in this one tactic, I'm not sure if they're going to get Joe Biden on board. So assuming that uh, Kamala comes out of the convention, and again, as I said, she may get a bump in the poll coming out of the convention, but say as time goes on, we're getting closer and closer to November, and she's not doing that well. I can see the Democrats putting more pressure on Joe Biden to step aside and let Kamala take the position of the presidency. Now, in their minds, this will likely help her in the polls again. But uh, don't be surprised if things don't go well f- for Kamala as we get closer and closer to November, that they're going to put pressure on Joe Biden to step aside. Put Kamala as president. Because in their minds, it'll be good for her in the polls. So we shall see. So the Secret Service director resigned this week. And that's the least that she could do for America. After a disastrous 
hearing this week before Congress. She resigned. She refused to answer any question, any significant question, about the assassination attempt. All she did was hide behind, well, there's an investigation going on. I can't talk about it. They had asked her, well, how many bullets casings did they find around the shooter? Well, I can't tell you. And we later found out the next day from the head of the uh, uh, Pennsylvania State Police that there were eight, but she refused to answer. She wouldn't even refuse. The simplest question she refused to answer. And in her own arrogant way, she thought she could play a rope-a-dope, just get through this day, and I'll get some uh, political people behind me trying to protect me. But this director, Cheadle, is just a perfect definition of an empty suit. Now, you don't hear that term anymore. But what's an empty suit? You can dress the person up in a suit, but they're useless. They know nothing. They're there for some other reason. And she's the epitome of an empty suit. Now, I think she read the writing on the wall when the Democrats that were interviewing her said, look, I think you got to resign. And she just refused to. She said, I'm not going to do it. One representative asked her, did you know what happened to the Secret Service director after Reagan was shot? And she goes, yes, I know. Well, what did he do? He was reassigned. Nope. Wrong answer. That Secret Service director resigned. She didn't even know that. But in her own arrogant way, she thought she could survive this. Because she's been taught that bureaucrats rarely get fired, particularly under the Biden administration. Look what happened uh, with the Afghanistan fiasco. Millie should have been fired. Secretary of State should have been fired. So in her mind, hey, if they're not fired, I'm not going to get fired here. So she arrogantly went up there and just tried to stonewall everything. So once uh, she saw that the Democrats were pushing for her resignation, and then I think the next day, I think it was one of the reps put a motion to introduce legislation to impeach her. She saw the writing on the wall and said, I can't get out of this. I'm going to resign. But I'm going to play a clip from the hearing. And it's with Rep, uh, Representative Timmons. And he's asking her about, well, Jill Biden, the first lady, had a fundraiser. I think there were like 400 people on the same day. And he wanted to know how many Secret Service agents were assigned to Jill Biden, the first lady, versus how many Secret Service agents were assigned to the rally. And it's been reported that um, many, many more Secret Service agents were assigned to a 400-person fundraiser for Jill Biden than they had at the rally. So let's go to this clip and then we'll come back and discuss. Multiple whistleblowers and various media outlets have reported that the Pittsburgh field office of the Secret Service allocated 12 additional post standers to the First Lady's event and three additional post standers to the Trump rally. Is that correct? There were no assets that were diverted from the First so no, 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 no. This business. is a very simple question. I'm not asking if anyone was diverted. Did the first lady's event that was relatively secure, especially compared to Trump's rally, get 12 assets. And the first, did the first lady's event get 12 assets and Trump's get three from the Pittsburgh field office? It's, that's a yes or no question. If you number, don't know, don't answer it. I mean, if you don't know, don't answer The number of personnel that were allocated to both of those events were comparable to the risk at both of those events. Wow. Really? So you think that the Pittsburgh casino, 400 person in a ballroom with ingress, egress through probably a very well-guarded parking garage was four times more dangerous than a 20,000 person rally in an open field with uh, the former president and future president? Uh, you think that that's four times more dangerous, the casino then? I didn't say that at all. Well, they got four times the resources from the Pittsburgh field office, who was likely in charge of the final walkthrough for both, for both events. 
I mean, we've continually highlighted the failures uh, of the Secret Service at the Trump rally. And, you know, you have the, the former and future president getting shot. You have uh, multiple uh, injuries, one fatality. And I would have to think that if we had nine more post standards, nine more individuals that have the training and the integration into the Secret Service uh, defense of, of Trump at that rally, that I have a feeling that Crooks would have had somebody come say hello to him before he fired a bunch of shots. What, do you think that's possibly true? There were significantly more assets and resources available at the former president's event yeah. than there were at the first. Who made the event. decision to, to deploy 12 uh, post standers to the casino uh, where the first lady was having a 400 person dinner and only three people from the Pittsburgh field office to the 20,000 plus in person plus Trump rally. Who made that decision? There were additional Secret Service resources available at the former President Trump's event. Who made the decision to deploy 12 to the First Lady's event and three to the Trump event? The allocation of resources is decided based on the availability of personnel and their location and where they are, but there were sufficient resources what did you just that say? were given to Did you just the say there were sufficient presidents. resources? President Trump got shot. Day. Someone got killed. There were not sufficient resources, clearly. And just a reminder, it was Jill Biden, the first lady, that had pushed for Cheadle to take the Secret Service position. Just remember that. And then Cheadle's response was just devastating. Oh, there were sufficient resources there. But it still goes back to my point is that it's not about capabilities with these people in Washington. It's about who they know, whether they be part of the deep state, the administrative state, in order for them to advance. And this cheat is typical of this mindset. Now, we found out from uh, Chris Ray, as well as the head of the uh, Pennsylvania State Police, um, a couple of items. And here's what uh, I think is really important and what we should know right now. One is this drone. Several hours before the rally, that this shooter was able to fly a drone over the site. Now, it didn't go over the stage site, but he was able to fly a drone in the outer perimeter of the site to get a good look at things. And if, if you've ever seen drone footage, you can be hundreds of yards away from something, get a good perspective of what you're looking at. And how was he able to do this? The day of the rally. Where's the advance team? Where's the Secret Service advance team? What were they doing? Second thing is that there were two snipers in a window that was overlooking the roof of the shooter. And where were they? What happened? They could have easily have shot this kid on the roof as he was climbing up. But you know what they did? They left. They, they got a report about the the shooter walking around the grounds. And so they left their position. They left that window unattended so they can go and look for that person. And if they were there, they would have been able to take out that shooter on that, uh, on that roof, but they weren't there. The other thing is the water tower about a hundred yards or 150 yards away was this water tower that was unattended. And it was Eli crane, uh, a former seal and sniper that asked questions, was, was the water tower, was anybody on the water tower? Nope. Would it have been wise to put a sniper up on the water tower? Because that position up there, you could see everything. You could take out somebody from the roof. And the state police chief was forthcoming. He said, yeah, somebody should have been there. But it wasn't his decision. It's the Secret Service's decision to look at a site and tell people where they should be. And that wasn't done. Oh, and before I forget, I just want to, you know, make a comment and uh, Corey Comparator. This poor guy gets killed defending his uh, children at the rally. And he truly is a hero. And there were two other people shot, too. So I just want to mention that, you know, President Trump got hurt, but there was somebody killed. Let's not forget that, too. And the other thing that intrigues me, that I want to know, why was that area considered less of a secure area than the other areas? 
what the the area wasn't given a higher threat level by Secret Service for some reason. I saw maps of all these other areas where Secret Service gave a higher threat level to, but not the area with, uh, on that roof, not the water tower. Maybe that's why that kid was, a late, uh, was able to fly that drone, because he flew it from an area where the Secret Service said, oh, yeah, well, that's, that's not a high threat area. Guy can only get a shot off 130 yards. Ah, that's not a high threat. No being on the water tower. Ah, that's uh, no threat. It's a waste of assets. Well, who made that decision? It was clearly the wrong decision. And the last thing that we found out is that this was intended to be a mass casualty event. Apparently that uh, this uh, shooter also had uh, bombs in his car, self-made bombs in his car. And so apparently, and this is only conjecture now, that there was uh, the intent of this uh, shooter was to not only kill President Trump, but kill as many people that he could in the audience. And... uh, and in the panic, which, by the way, there was no panic. As much as Donald Trump was cool, calm, and collective, the people in the audience were too. They didn't panic. But the shooter had planned for there to be some type of panic. So he had planned on detonating the bombs that were in his car so he could kill even more people as they left the grounds. So I think Chris Ray also mentioned that, you know, not only is this an assassination attempt, it's also a terrorist attempt. Now, before you start thinking that uh, Ray's doing the right thing, he wasn't forthcoming. He was hiding behind the whole, can't talk about this because of uh, investigation. Ray was just a little smarter and smoother than uh, Cheadle. So where do we go from here? I heard uh, there's a report, and I think it's true, is that there will be a bipartisan investigation on this in Congress. And I'm not sure when it's going to start. But it should start soon. And I'm hoping that it's sooner better than later because Donald Trump is still not safe. But Ray still had to get his dig in. And one thing that he mentioned during the hearing is that, oh, he couldn't rule out that Trump was hit with uh, shrapnel or glass during the uh, assassination attempt. And this was totally rebuffed by the doctors involved with uh, treating Donald Trump. The doctors that treated Donald Trump said, no, this is a, uh, a bullet wound. It's not shrapnel. It's not glass. But I just find it really ironic how uh, Ray, in being forthcoming, tries to throw something like this out there. Now, the last thing I want to talk about, and I want to go to an article here from the Gateway Pundit. And the headline says, former CIA analyst, wife of Washington Post writer Max Boot, has been charged with espionage. So Max Boot is this never Trumper. He's been one of the, uh, he's a writer for the Washington Post, and they pushed this whole Russia, Russia, Russia gate. Well, guess what? His wife, who is a former CIA employee, an analyst. She was selling secrets to the South Korean government. But remember this. When a Democrat or person from the mainstream media wants to point a finger and attack you for something, it's all projection. It's what they're doing. So you had Max Boot pointing a finger at Donald Trump about being a Russian agent. Meanwhile, his wife is a South Korean agent. It also tells us a lot about the deep state. It's all about the power for them. It's all about the money for them. They'll sell at this country because they don't care about this country. They want a global world. No borders. So it's much easier for them to sell out the United States when they don't believe in the United States. They don't believe in any nation state. And this is what we're dealing with. And this is what Donald Trump is going to smash. And with that said, thank you very much for listening. You have a good week, and I will talk to you next Saturday.